Hello and welcome. I'm Dave. Today we will learn about functions in Python. And I'll provide links to all resources in the description below. I've got Visual Studio Code open and a new Lesson 9 folder open over here in the file tree. Let's create a new file and let's call this file functions.py. Functions are reusable blocks of code. And when we call a function, it runs the block of code inside the function. So let's create a simple function. I'll start with the def keyword, which means we're defining the function. Then we'll use hello to name our function and we'll use parentheses. So our function is named hello. And after the colon, we'll press enter and notice VS code brings us down to the next line and already indents. So this is where our block of code inside the function starts. So now we can print and we'll say hello world with an exclamation mark. Now that is our function, but it is defined here. It is not being called yet. So if we're to run our code right now, we won't see any output. We won't see this print statement happen. So I can run it and we don't get any output over here. So what we need to do is call the function. So we do that then in our code, wherever we need to use the function, by just calling the name of the function with the parentheses after it. So now when I save this, and it scrolled back up, but there we go, there's our definition of the function, and here is the call to the function. Now we'll just run the code, and we get hello world here as output in our terminal. I'm going to go ahead and leave this open, but I'll press control B to hide the file tree, as we don't really need to see the file tree right now. Now let's talk about naming functions. They need to be all lowercase. And if they have more than one word, we can separate the words with an underscore. So let's do that and rename this function hello world. And now you can see Visual Studio Code is telling us that there is not a hello function. So we need to go ahead and add the underscore world here. And now we'll call the function by name once again using hello world. So we get the same output. But that's how we want to name these. No capital letters, no hyphens or dashes. We need to use underscores if we want to separate a word, and we need to use all lowercase. Now, sometimes functions need to receive data, and we can use placeholders for that data, and those placeholders are called parameters. So let's go ahead and create a simple function that receives a couple of parameters. So I'll say def once again, the keyword def, and then I'll call this sum. It's going to receive num1 and num2. We'll put the colon here, and now we start the block of code inside the function, and we're going to print num1 plus num2. So once again, a very simple function. Now remember that this function is not being called yet. So if we were to run our code right now, we would not see the output of this. We need to call the function. Now these placeholders are parameters. When we call the function and we pass in the actual data, we're passing in arguments. So if I say sum and I pass in two and then three, now we're going to pass in the arguments two and three and they will use the definition of this function. So they're represented here by num1 and num2. A distinction between parameters in the definition and arguments that you would pass in is the parameters never change. However, arguments can change with every function call. So let's switch this to one and let's say seven, or this could even be 100, and then we could leave that as three. So all of these function calls are reusing this code that we defined for our function sum. Notice the parameters never change. They're just placeholders. So that is the difference between a parameter and an argument. The argument is the actual data when the function is called. So now let's go ahead and save this code and we'll run our code and we'll get the output here. So we have the sum of all of those numbers underneath of our hello world. And note, this was also a good demonstration of how our function is reusable. So we have a reusable function that we can use anywhere we need it now. And we used it three times here with different arguments. Now our function isn't really too useful if it just prints this value to the console. We might want to return that value and use it in our program. So let's look at how we can do that. And I'm just going to change this function. So we'll remove these, but of course you know how to call the function now. And instead of a print here, we'll remove the print and the parentheses. I'm going to use the keyword return. So our function actually returns the value, the total of the two parameters that are here. So the, 
whichever arguments we pass in. If we pass in two and three, it should return five. So let's do that now by saying a new variable total equals the sum of two and three. And then we can print the total just to verify that yes, total now holds that value. So now let's run our code again. And that's what we get is five right here. Now, right now, our sum function is a very basic function, and we are just assuming that two numbers will be passed in. But we can't always make those assumptions when we are writing programs. So let's verify that we're actually receiving numbers, because if we passed in strings right now, they could be concatenated together because it would just push the two strings together and that would also work. And that's not what we want our sum function to do, for example. So let's go ahead and check some of our input here, our parameters that are being passed in. Well, the arguments are the values, but the parameters is what we'll check in the definition. So here we'll say if, and then let's check the type of num1, and we'll say is not int. And then we could also say, or type of num2 is not int. So here's our if statement. We put a colon at the end, and now we want to have a return keyword here. But notice we're not returning anything. This is just called an early return. So we're exiting the function. It will never execute line 11 here in our code. It will never return the sum of num1 and num2 because they are not integers. Now I can press Alt-Z to wrap this code down or I can close this so we can see the full line here. So now let's see what happens if I change one of our arguments to something that is not an integer. I'll just pass in a string with the letter A. So I'll save the code and once again run the Python file. And now our function returned none. That is a special value in Python. It's not true or false, it's just none. So that's also something to be aware of if you ever see that. However, that's what is returned from the function. So currently our total value is none. So now we're ensuring to get a result from our sum function that two integers do need to be passed in. But what happens if nothing is passed in? We'll probably get an error. So let's confirm this when I remove the arguments from the function call and once again run the function. And yes, we received an error. It says sum is missing two required positional arguments, num1 and num2. So our check here, our if statement, doesn't really help if somebody forgets to pass in those arguments. But there's something else we can do. We can give default values for these parameters in case they are not passed in. So now let's just provide one default parameter value and I'll just make num2 equal to three. So now I can just pass in one number, say the number one, and I can call the function and num2 will automatically have the value of three. So if I do this and run the Python code, we get four for the output. Of course, this doesn't help if somebody forgets to pass in the first value. So one thing we could do is say num1 has a default value of zero and num2 has a default value of zero. So now if no numbers are passed in, we should receive a total of zero and we do. And if we pass in just one value, say the number one, we should get one in return. However, our function does accept two values so we can pass in a second argument and now it should add those two numbers together and we get three. So I'll once again press Alt-Z to just wrap this code down to the next line so it doesn't extend off the screen here. But what we have accomplished now with our function is we have default parameter values of zero for num1 and num2. And we're also checking to make sure that the values passed into the function are integers. And if they're not, we just have an early return. But possibly instead of that none value, if we always want to have a number returned, we could just return zero as well. So now if we save our function and once again call it without any of the arguments being passed in and we run the function, instead of none, we get zero. That might be more useful if we're just using this in mathematical equations because zero is something we could continue to use in the program and it wouldn't be some expected out, uh, unexpected output like the word none. 
Now, just as a reminder of how to call this function, I'm going to put a couple of numbers in here, like seven and two. So this will be in the course resources, and you'll see, once again, how to call the function with two arguments, and we get the output of nine. Okay, now some functions may receive multiple arguments, but when you're defining the function, you won't know how many arguments are going to be passed into it. So let's go ahead and look at a function that would be handling that type of parameter input. So I'll use the def keyword once again, and then we'll say multiple, if I could spell multiple, and underscore items. That's what I'm calling this function. And now it's going to receive an amount of parameters, essentially arguments, that we don't know. These are often abbreviated as args, even though in the definition they should be referred to as parameters. What we want to do when we don't know how many we're going to receive is start with an asterisk. And then I'll use the word args here to represent the arguments that will be passed in. Now, inside of the function, I'm going to print args so we can see what we get. I'm also going to print the type of the args so we can also see what type those args are and how they're represented in the code block of the function because that would be important to know for you. So now when I call the function, I will say multiple items and I'll pass in Dave and John and let's pass in Sarah. Okay, so now let's go ahead and run the code. We're calling the function here on line 23, and we should get two lines of output. We're printing the args and then what type they are here. So let's run the code. Notice we get the args right here, and it looks like a tuple, and sure enough, that's what type it is. So if we have an unknown amount of arguments that will be passed into our function, we can define the parameters here, we could use any word we want. I'm just representing them as args, which is fairly common. But we want to start with one asterisk here, and that will make the data inside the function a tuple. And then, of course, we can work with it as we learned about tuples. But notice these arguments that are passed in here, we just have values and represented in the parameter area here inside the definition. They don't have names like before we had num1 and num2, and we could refer to them by name inside of the function's code block. So what if we have a function that has, again, multiple unknown items that will be passed in when we're defining it, but we want to use actually keyword arguments. So I'll define another function here, and I'll just abbreviate this as mult, and then I'll say named items. And here we'll start with two asterisks. And now you'll often see this word. It's a weird word. It's quargs, which stands for keyword arguments. Once again, you could use any word here, but this is what you would typically see. So that's why I'm using this, and it stands for keyword arguments. Once again, in the function definition, it's representing the arguments, and we actually refer to that in the definition as parameters. So now inside this definition, I'm going to print the quargs, and then I'm also going to print the type of the quargs. So now let's go ahead and call this, and I'm going to use this same line of code here. I'll just switch the function name so we have a different function call. So instead of multiple items, this will be our mult named items. So underscore named underscore items. There we go, so now we're calling this function and we'll run the code, and I got an error, and that's because I forgot to actually name the items here. So let's do this differently. Instead of Dave, John, and Sarah, which won't make as much sense, let's go first equals Dave, and then last equals Gray. So now we have actually two named arguments, and that's what I forgot to do when I called this. I was in too much of a hurry. So these will be represented in the function as first and last. So let's go ahead and run our Python code. And so now, of course, here we have our tuple output above that I left in, but now we have a dictionary, and that's what we got when we printed the quargs here. So we have a dictionary with first and last, and you can see it is type dictionary. 
And then we could work with this data as a dictionary, and we learned about dictionaries in a previous lesson as well. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection, and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you, and thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.